Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's core curriculum session. Dr. Gopi Nayak and myself, Salman Ahmed, will serve as moderators for this session on gland imaging. Our first talk will be given by Dr. Jared Steinklein, Assistant Professor of Radiology at Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra and Northwell Lenox Hill Hospital. Dr. Steinklein will be speaking to us on anatomy of the glands of the head and neck. Virtual greetings from New York City. I'm Jared Steinklein from Lenox Hill Hospital, and I'll be speaking on the anatomy of the glands in the head and the neck. This talk will include a comprehensive but basic review of the multiple glands in the head and neck, reviewing their anatomy, histology, physiology, and of course their normal imaging appearance, and which imaging modality is best. Also included throughout the talk are some normal variants and ectopic locations of glands often encountered. There are both exocrine and endocrine glands found in the head and neck. Exocrine glands produce fluid that drains into a body cavity and are mostly activated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Endocrine glands produce hormones that circulate through the bloodstream and are regulated by other hormones or metabolites in circulation via feedback loops. First up, the lacrimal gland is an orbital structure that produces tears, mostly serous in composition. Histology shows the compact acinar units that produce serous secretions. The top graphic depicts numerous small ducts that aren't readily seen on imaging, highlighted in red, that drain at the conjunctival fornix. Innervation of the gland is complex with both sensory and parasympathetic supply and complex interconnection between branches of the trigeminal and facial nerves, as detailed on the slide. On CT, the lacrimal gland is isodense to muscle without contrast, but better demarcated and avidly enhancing with contrast. Note its position in the supralateral orbit abutting the globe and conjunctiva. There's a specific groove in the bony orbit called the lacrimal fossa. On MRI, the lacrimal glands are mildly hyperintense to muscle on T1 and T2 weighted imaging, as most glands are. Post-contrast imaging below shows avid enhancement of the glands with normal microlobular and mostly homogeneous appearance. Location of the lacrimal gland appears postseptal and extraconal. On the middle image, the gland appears posterior to a thin visualized septum marked by the red arrow. But after all, tears aren't secreted into the postseptal space, so finer and smaller inspection of anatomy is required. This case made me question the location of the lacrimal gland. Clearly, this is preceptal or periorbital cellulitis in the left image, but there's also asymmetric enlargement and enhancement of the lacrimal gland, findings of dacryoidinitis. Unclear if this is reactive tear production and hyperemia, or is there a direct spread of inflammation? In the illustration on the right, there's actually a small palpebral lobe of the gland that extends anterior to the levator aponeurosis and tarsal plate in the preceptal space. So the lacrimal gland is both a preceptal and postseptal structure, but mostly the latter. Here is a case of prolapsed lacrimal glands, which accompany prolapse of extraconal postseptal fat. This is seen in the setting of aging and thinning of the orbital septum and with overall excess fat deposition. This can be seen often in the setting of thyroid eye disease. Finally, a frequent incidental finding seen at the lacrimal region is a glaucoma valve implant, not to be mistaken for pathology. Moving on to the salivary glands, displayed here is a basic illustration I made of their composition. On the left image, an acinus is a solitary unit of columnar epithelial cells that produce and secrete saliva, which then exits via a ductule. On the middle image, a clustered group of acini with conjoined ducts and a terminal ductule comprise a minor salivary gland. On the right, you see a more highly organized system of tubular acinar units that drain into a common duct, reflecting the composition of the major salivary glands. Also note the major salivary glands are encapsulated by connective tissue, and also invested by deep layers of cervical fascia, with the exception of the sublingual gland. Embryologically, salivary glands arise from the primitive oral cavity or stomodium. The parotid is the first gland to form and arises from ectoderm, and the smaller glands are endodermal derivatives and form a few weeks later. 
Minor salivary gland rests are deposited throughout, especially in the oral cavity, which we'll discuss later in the talk. The parotid gland is the largest and most complex of the major salivary glands. Although it's the largest, it produces only a minority of daily saliva, mostly active when eating, um, with serous composition and amylase secreted for starch digestion. Sensory innervation is from the auricular temporal nerve, a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, and parasympathetic supply travels via the ninth cranial nerve. The gland is highly organized into lobes and stratified ductal system converging on the main parotid duct anteriorly. It is the only salivary gland which normally contains lymph nodes. On histology, note the clear adipose cells, which may predominate over time and give the gland its typical hyperintense appearance on T1-weighted MR. The parotid gland has its own namespace in the head and neck, invested by the superficial layer of deep cervical fascia, and there's intimate proximity to the masticator and parapharyngeal spaces. The gland has both superficial and deep lobes bridging at the stylomandibular tunnel. The separate lobes of the parotid gland are also depicted nicely on these MR images, and the most inferior portion of the superficial lobe is called the tail, as seen on the bottom left image, roughly at the level of the angle of the mandible. The deep and superficial lobes are separated by an anterior-posterior plane, defined by the proximal facial nerve surgically, and by the retromandibular vein on most routine imaging, but both can be identified on this high-resolution face MRI. As I referred to earlier, the parotid undergoes fatty involution with age, as seen on the image on the right, and it's a good reminder to always include pre-contrast T1 imaging on face MRI protocols, as pathology may be more conspicuous in a background of brighter fat signal. This case was sent to us for a palpable facial mass. MRI simply points out accessory parotid tissue of normal signal, identical to the remaining parotid tissue. Asymmetric, yes, but not pathologic. The parotid duct exits the anterior superficial parotid lobe and courses within buccal fat, superficial to the masseter muscle. It is best visualized on fat-saturated T2-aided MR imaging shown here. On this thin section T2 coronal image, the duct is nicely shown to pierce the buccinator muscle as it drains into the oral cavity at a papilla along buccal mucosa, usually at the level of the second maxillary molar. This patient was referred to evaluate a left oral cavity submucosal mass. The enhancement followed the parotid duct proximally and worrisome for a salivary tumor. The middle image shows intraglandular ductal dilatation, and the right image shows worrisome asymmetric enhancement at the infraorbital nerve. In this patient with facial anesthesia, also a worrisome clinical finding. Biopsy proved this to be adenoid cystic carcinoma, which is notorious for perineural tumor spread. The parotid gland is the only salivary gland with lymph nodes, and they are usually small, multiple, and bilateral, and considered normal if less than or equal to six millimeters. When pathologic in size are grossly abnormal compared to other nodes in the upper neck, get tissue sampling to assess for possible lymphoma or nodal metastatic disease. Perhaps what makes the parotid gland most challenging from a surgical perspective is its incorporation of the facial nerve and its main branches. On pre-contrast T1 MR imaging shown here, the descending extra parotid nerve is nicely depicted within fat at the infratemporal fossa. On the volume rendered CT inferior view of the skull base, you see the stylomastoid foramina where the facial nerves exit. Mapping of the distal facial nerve and branching within the parotid gland can prove difficult. The left image shows normal branching of the intraglandular nerve on a double echo steady state acquisition or DES scan described in an AJNR article from last year. The right imaging shows the most classic but often variable branching pattern with a mnemonic acronym for the five major branches, two zebras bit my clavicle. Clavicle aptly chosen here for the platysma muscle that inserts on the clavicle and innervated by the cervical branch of the facial nerve. Here is a case of a right parotid mucoepidermoid carcinoma with perineural tumor spread denoted by the red arrows compared to the normal left facial nerve canal circled in blue. This is additionally seen as pathologic branching and linear enhancement on the coronal post-contrast imaging. In this additional case of a left parotid lymphoepithelial carcinoma, 
Anti-grade perineural tumor spread is noted along the buccal branch of the facial nerve. Closer to the skull base, pathologic linear enhancement extends medially and encases the mandibular nerve, with gross enlargement and signal abnormality of the left mandibular nerve on the thin section T2 image on the right. This exemplifies perineural tumor spread between the facial and trigeminal nerves via the auricular temporal nerve. Now moving on to the submandibular space and glands. The submandibular gland lies within the submandibular space and produces a more mucinous saliva compared to the parotid glands with more mixed histology shown on the bottom right image. Innervation is provided by the lingual nerve with parasympathetic supply traveling via the corda tympani of the facial nerve. On CT, normal submandibular glands have lobular contour and are mostly uniform in density and enhancement. The hilum of the submandibular duct is often visualized. On the middle image, note the facial vein separates the gland from an adjacent normal lymph node. The mylohyoid muscle and boundary between the sublingual space is approximated with CT, but better seen on MRI. Here are a couple cases showing masses of the submandibular gland that are medial to the facial vein. So don't call these pathologic lymph nodes. The submandibular duct is best appreciated on T2-weighted imaging with fat suppression, as on the left image. The gland is mildly hyperintense relative to muscle, but not as intense as adjacent lymph nodes seen. The coronal images follow the duct as it skirts along the posterior margin of the mylohyoid muscle and eventual course to the anterior floor of mouth. Stones are more frequently encountered in the submandibular gland and duct due to their more mucinous content. Larger stones may impact proximal prior to passing the mylohyoid muscle as on the left image, whereas smaller stones may impact at the most narrow portion of the duct at the punctum as in the right image, lying on each side of the lingual frenulum at the floor of mouth. Stones at this site can be very difficult to see due to their small size and potential for streak artifact obscuration. The sublingual space and floor of mouth are essentially synonymous, lying above the mylohyoid sling. The sublingual gland and its ducts, as well as the submandibular duct, lie in the lateral sublingual space, lateral to the hyoglossus muscle and neurovascular bundle. Histology shows greater concentration of mucinous cells compared to the parotid and submandibular glands. Of note, the sublingual gland is not encapsulated, which may facilitate local spread of malignancy. It possesses multiple terminal ducts that project into the floor of mouth cavity, as shown in the left illustration, which are not routinely seen on imaging. MRI better depicts the mylohyoid muscle compared to CT and the sublingual glands. The image on the right shows a variant with conjoined sublingual glands at the anterior midline floor of mouth. Defects in the mylohyoid muscle are very common and sublingual glands can often protrude into the submandibular space or vice versa. MRI offers the best soft tissue contrast resolution to demonstrate this tissue is identical to the other salivary glands, but is often not necessary. Here are several other examples of sublingual glands herniating through mylohyoid or boutonniere defects. Minor salivary glands are dispersed all over the aerodigestive tract with nearly 1,000 throughout the submucosal oral cavity, especially at the lips, inner cheeks, and palate. They lack a capsule and organized tubuloacinar architecture. As a general rule, the smaller the salivary gland, the greater odds of a mass being malignant. Minor salivary glands are most abundant in the submucosal oral cavity, as noted by the arrows, and are mostly mucinous, except for at the posterior oral tongue. Don't forget to include minor salivary tumors and the differential diagnosis for head and neck malignancy, especially in young patients and in the absence of traditional risk factors for head and neck cancer, or if the mass is clinically reported to be submucosal in location. This is an example of a nasopharyngeal adenoid cystic carcinoma. Moving on to endocrine glands, we'll review the pituitary, thyroid, and parathyroid glands. The pituitary gland is often called the master gland as its hormones affect a multitude of end organs as shown in the illustration above. 
The gland resides in the cella tersica, a central depression of the sphenoid body. Interestingly, etymologically speaking, early anatomists first believed the gland produced phlegm, but were clearly mistaken. Understanding the embryology of the pituitary gland is important into understanding the pathology. The majority of pituitary hormones are produced in the adenohypophysis, or anterior pituitary, the derivative of oral ectoderm that ascends up to the skull base, whereas the neurohypophysis, or posterior pituitary gland, forms and descends from the primitive diencephalon, or neuroectoderm. These two ectodermal derivatives intertwine and form the pituitary gland. When fusion is incomplete, a remnant along Rathi's clefts may be left behind, as shown as a Rathi's cleft cyst on the bottom left images with classic T1 hyperintense and T2 hypointense appearance. Normal pituitary MRI is shown here with non-contrast sagittal T1 imaging showing the expected hyperintense signal of the neurohypothesis or bright spot and the coronal post-contrast image on the right showing homogeneous and symmetric enhancement of the gland with a thin and midline appearance of the stalk. Height of the pituitary gland greatly varies with age, gender, and with pregnancy or menstrual cycle in females. Shown here are some physiologic variants. The left image shows physiologic hyperplasia of the gland in pregnancy, and the right image shows an empty cella, which is often an incidental finding in an elderly patient due to weakening of the diaphragmatic cella and pulsation of CSF over time. In a younger patient, an empty cella may be a sign of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. These are examples of an ectopic neurohypothesis due to incomplete descent. These may be associated with other CNS anomalies and sometimes in the setting of septo-optic dysplasia, but most often present in the setting of dwarfism. A rarer location for pituitary tissue is within the sphenoid sinus of unclear etiology. Shown in this additional case is a persistent craniopharyngeal canal with CSF and pituitary tissue at the nasopharynx that one should not biopsy. Moving on to the thyroid gland, it was named as such because it resembles a shield as a bilobed organ connected by a midline isthmus. Thyroid hormone is essential for cellular function and metabolism throughout the body. Histology shows the typical follicular morphology containing dense and iodinated colloid. Parafollicular cells or C cells produce calcitonin and are scattered surrounding the follicles and adjacent to vasculature. The illustration on the right shows the feedback loop controlling thyroid hormone levels by the hypothalamic pituitary axis. The thyroid gland lies within the central or visceral compartment of the neck, invested by the middle layer of deep cervical fascia. In addition, the gland has a capsule. Note its close proximity to the recurrent laryngeal nerve and of course the trachea and esophagus. The thyroid gland is a highly vascular organ with dual blood supply from the superior thyroidal artery arising as the first branch off the external carotid artery and from the inferior thyroidal artery, a proximal branch of the thyrocervical trunk arising from the subclavian artery. Ultrasound is the mainstay for imaging of the thyroid gland due to its superior spatial resolution of a superficial organ. It also allows for FNA for suspicious nodules or masses. The gland appears as a mostly homogeneous and hyperechoic organ with greatest dimension in the sagittal plane. Here are CT images of a normal thyroid gland with notable hyperdense appearance on the non-contrast image on the left due to its iodine content. On the middle image, the gland enhances avidly and homogeneously. On the right image, there is often streak artifact that courses through the lower poles. Anatomy in this location and at the thoracic inlet is often difficult to visualize on CT due to shoulder streak artifact as well as streaking from incoming dense contrast. CT is best utilized in mapping the extent of tumor or goiter prior to surgical resection and to assess for lymphadenopathy or local invasive in mapping of a thyroid carcinoma. MRI is often limited 
of the thyroid gland due to respiratory motion and inhomogeneity of signal at the junction of the neck and thoracic inlet. The gland is mildly hyperintense to muscle on T1 imaging due to its proteinaceous content of colloid, and the gland is similar intensity or slightly hyperintense to muscle on T2 imaging. The orange arrow denotes the recurrent laryngeal nerve as it ascends the central compartment on its way to the larynx. Diagnostic utility of MRI is best served in the setting of thyroid cancer when degree of tracheal wall or esophageal wall invasion is queried prior to thyroidectomy. Here are examples of a normal variant called the tubercle of Zucker candle, an exophytic projection from the lower pole. On the leftmost image, you can see how it may simulate a parathyroid adenoma if non-contrast imaging weren't performed. Ectopic thyroid is quite common and occurs along the course of the thyroglossal duct tract highlighted in red. The most common ectopia is a simple cyst, but functioning or nodular thyroid tissue may exist along the tract as well. Rarely ectopic thyroid tissue may predispose malignancy. Here are examples of a pyramidal lobe, a normal variant as a thin and midline projection of thyroid tissue that extends superiorly along the course of the thyroglossal duct with an accompanying cyst shown on the leftmost image. They all may also present clinically with nodules in the setting of multinodular goiter shown in the rightmost images. The most classic example of total thyroid ectopia is a lingual thyroid seen as homogeneously enhancing round tissue at the base of tongue. Note the lack of normal thyroid tissue in its normal location on the leftmost image. A nuclear medicine I-123 scan on the right image shows a lingual focus of uptake, but lack of uptake in the lower neck above the sternal notch marker. The parathyroid glands are probably the most difficult glands to image based on their small size and propensity for ectopia. They play a vital role in calcium homeostasis. Histology shows high concentration of adipose cells, a capsule surrounding the gland, and composition of chief cells which produce the parathyroid hormone. The illustration on the right shows classic position of the superior and inferior paired parathyroid glands. Of note, up to 5% of the population may have variation in this anatomy with either supernumerary or less than normal number of glands. Normal parathyroid glands are not routinely seen on imaging. They're about the size of a grain of rice. So we'll focus on parathyroid adenoma in discussion. Embryology is important in understanding that the inferior glands derive from the third branchial pouch and descend along with the thymus. For this reason, it's more common for the inferior glands to reside in an ectopic location, especially at the mediastinum where the thymus has descended. Since normal anatomy of the parathyroid glands is not in our routine practice, I'll discuss imaging of parathyroid adenomas. Roughly 90% of the time, primary hyperparathyroidism is caused by a single adenoma. The remaining cases are complicated by multiglandular disease, ectopic sites of adenoma, or parathyroid hyperplasia. Parathyroid carcinoma is extremely rare. Imaging is accomplished with ultrasound, CT with special protocol, nuclear imaging, unquestionably with MRI. Ultrasound can be a quick and easy modality to diagnose a parathyroid adenoma when they lie in typical location. They are notably hypoechoic to thyroid tissue seen posteriorly to the thyroid gland and show peripheral vascularity. However, ultrasound lacks spatial ability to evaluate for potential ectopic adenomas, especially inferior to the thyroid gland. Most routinely done at our shop is parathyroid 4D CT with images acquired first without contrast and then in both the arterial and venous phases of contrast injection. Here's a classic example of a hypervascular parathyroid adenoma posterior to the left thyroid gland. In this other example, the presence of a polar vessel may help localize the adenoma. Nuclear imaging is also done routinely at our shop, especially when problem solving in the setting of bilateral or potential ectopic candidate lesions for parathyroid adenoma. Parathyroid tissue has prolonged retention of sesamity and becomes conspicuous on the delayed images. Here's a great example of focal delayed uptake at the right central compartment of the neck in a parathyroid adenoma, and SPECT CT allows for even better localization of the parathyroid adenoma. Perhaps the most crucial advantage of nuclear imaging is detection of ectopic adenomas in the mediastinum. 
and detection of unexpected supernumerary disease. On CT, it may be impossible to differentiate mediastinal lymph nodes from adenomas. This case depicts a pretracheal ectopic parathyroid adenoma. There is limited utility for MRI in evaluating parathyroid gland disease, in my humble opinion, but it is an evolving technique. Parathyroid adenomas are certainly visible when large, as quite T2 hyperintense nodules with avid contrast enhancement. I've even picked up a couple incidental parathyroid adenomas on neck MRI, some functional and some not, so be on the lookout. In conclusion, knowledge of detailed anatomy and specific physiology of the glands of the head and neck is essential. The lacrimal gland lies in the supralateral extraconal orbit and is mostly postseptal location aside from its small palpebral lobe. Pathology of the lacrimal gland includes salivary tumors as well as lymphoproliferative disorders. The parotid gland is unique given it's the only gland that contains lymph nodes, given its close proximity to the skull base, and of course its relation to the facial nerve. The submandibular and sublingual glands in their respective compartments are separated by the mylohyoid muscle, which is frequently deficient. Minor salivary glands are most concentrated in the oral cavity, and submucosal masses in this location should include salivary pathology in the differential diagnosis. The pituitary gland is optimally evaluated with MRI, and understanding its embryology can help identify ectopic variants as opposed to tumors. The thyroid gland is best evaluated at the ultrasound in terms of nodule characterization and ability for tissue sampling, but evaluation with CT or MRI in the setting of goiter too large to assess with ultrasound or in the setting of cancer staging is warranted. Thyroglossal duct remnants are commonly encountered as incidental findings. The parathyroid glands are not seen when they're normal, but they're challenging to image in the setting of parathyroid adenoma with varying imaging modalities available. With that, I conclude my talk and thank you very much for your attention. Hi, my name is Gopi Nayak. I'm a clinical assistant professor of neuroradiology at NYU Langone Medical Center. And it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Elliot Friedman. He's an associate professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, and he's going to be presenting his talk, Salivary Gland Tumors Benign to Malignant. My name is Elliot Friedman from the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, and today I'm going to talk about salivary gland neoplasms. I'm excited to be a part of Virtual ASHNR 2020, and I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to participate. I have no disclosures. My objectives today are to focus on high yield points in the imaging evaluation of salivary gland tumors. We're going to discuss a number of imaging characteristics that may help to suggest that a mass is either benign or low grade malignant versus a high grade malignancy. Scattered throughout the talk will be key imaging points and potential pitfalls. There's a, tr there's a tremendous amount of overlap in the imaging appearance of salivary gland tumors, so we're not going to go through endless examples, but instead we're going to review the imaging features of some of the most common tumors, as well as those with some characteristic imaging findings. Finally, we're going to briefly discuss some reporting features that are important for prognosis and staging. Salivary gland tumors are among the most histologically heterogeneous groups of tumors in humans. They most, mostly occur in adults, but they account for less than 6% of tumors of the head and neck in adults, which amounts to approximately one salivary gland malignancy per 100,000 people in the U.S. Most primary salivary tumors occur in the parotid gland. Only about 5% of salivary gland neoplasms occur in children, but a higher proportion of neoplasms are malignant in children compared to adults. The smaller the gland size, the higher the risk of malignancy in adults. In children, the majority of malignancies occur in the parotid gland. Malignancies in children tend to do better than adults. They're typically less advanced in presentation with more favorable features. We're not gonna discuss glandular anatomy in depth in this talk, but we should note a few relevant facts. Due to its relatively late encapsulation, the parotid gland is the only salivary gland to contain lymph nodes, most located in the superficial lobe. These nodes provide drainage of the skin of the scalp, face, and ear. The accessory gland is present overlying the mass or muscle in approximately 20% of patients, as we see here. And here's an example of a carcinoma arising from the accessory glandular tissue on the right and extending along the parotid duct. Roughly 80% of salivary gland masses occur in the parotid gland in adults, and 80% of these are benign, most commonly pleomorphic adenoma. Minor salivary glands are small clusters of glandular tissue, approximately 800 to 1,000, scattered throughout the submucosa of the upper air of the digestive tract, including the oral cavity and floor of mouth, pharynx, and sinonasal cavities. The anterior heart palate and gingiva, however, tend to lack minor salivary glands. The most common tumor of the minor salivary glands is the adenoid cystic carcinoma. 
and it's most commonly located at the junction of the hard and soft palate, as we can see here. Sometimes, as seen here, adenoid cystics enhance poorly, um, and in this case on the palate, the only clue of, of a mass is the asymmetry. They're easy to overlook, and they may not present until there's clinical evidence of perineural spread. On CT, we, we look for bone erosion, as we can see here in the palate, um, or, or a possible enlargement of the greater or lesser palatine foramen. In adults, the smaller the salivary gland, the higher the risk of malignancy. Here's a chart showing the variation in benign, bright orange, from malignant, dark orange neoplasms. In the parotid gland, roughly 75 to 80% of tumors are benign. And this drops to about 60% benign in the submandibular gland. The majority of tumors in sublingual and minor salivary glands are malignant, to the point that no matter the imaging appearance, masses arising in the sublingual or minor salivary glands should be presumed malignant until you have pathologic evidence otherwise. In children, the majority of tumors and malignancies arise in the parotid, although mesenchymal tumors such as mangiomas are more common than in adults. The latest WHO classification of salivary gland tumors uh, categorizes epithelial tumors as benign or malignant, mesenchymal tumors, and hematolymphoid tumors. In addition, there's involvement of the product gland by metastatic disease. So then what's the best way to image and work up salivary gland masses? In adults, CT is generally the best choice uh, for, to start off with in imaging. It's quick, it's widely available, and it's easy to perform. It easily screens for salivary or other neck masses and lymphadenopathy. It can detect bone changes, and it's the preferred imaging modality for obstructive disease and salathiasis, or when inflammatory disease is suspected. Some masses uh, can be isodense to the parotid, as we can see here, there's no, di no discernible mass, but an MRI performed about a week later clearly shows a uh, well-defined mass in the superficial lobe of the left parotid gland. While CT can be useful for the identification and initial characterization of salivary masses, it's limited in tissue characterization. Take, for example, these three heterogeneity-enhancing parotid masses. We have a Warthin tumor, we have a pleomorphic adenoma, and we have a sarcoma. Quite different pathologies from benign to malignant, but impossible to distinguish on these images. How about MRI? Well, compared to CT, it provides better tissue characterization, but it's still limited in the ability to provide a definitive histopathologic diagnosis. Certain features, such as low ADC or T2, can suggest malignancy, but there are exceptions. MRI is indicated in case of facial or trigeminal palsy or meningeal signs, and it's the best modality for detecting perineal spread. T1-weighted non-contrast images performed without fat saturation provide good delineation of the mass against normal parotid gland, as we can see here with this squamous cell carcinoma that's invading the parotid gland and extending along the mastoid tip. It's important to remember that bright T2 signal does not necessarily mean a lesion cystic. We have two similar appearing T2 bright lesions um, in the parotid glands, but only by adding contrast can we distinguish a cyst, in this case of a salicyl, from a solid mass, in this case of a pleomorphic adenoma. PET-CT is most useful in detecting pathologic lymphadenopathy and distant metastatic disease, but it's limited in distinguishing benign from malignant disease. Pleomorphic adenoma and a Warthin tumor, as shown in this example here, are benign tumors, but they're FDG avid. Additionally, inflammatory disease and postdoctoral scarring can be FDG avid. Another important point is to remember that the degree of enhancement is not a predictor of malignancy. Now, distinguishing benign from malignant neoplasm is not always possible by imaging, but we can use certain imaging features, which I've, I've listed here, and we're going to discuss over the next several slides to suggest that a mass may be more likely to be malignant. Clinically, facial nerve palsy is a, is a concerning sign for malignancy. So sharp margins tend to be a, a predictor of benign or, or low-grade malignancy, whereas poorly defined margins are more concerning for, for a high-grade malignancy. Here we have a sharply defined left parapharyngeal state, space mass, uh, which displaces without invades adjacent muscles, and this was a pleomorphic adenoma. Now compare that to this mass on the, in the left parotid gland here, which it was a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma, uh, which had hazy margins, as we can see along the borders. Now, there are exceptions to this finding. Low-grade malignancies like the mucoepidermic carcinoma we see here in this right parotid gland can have sharply defined margins. On the other hand, look at this case, which is uh, showing an enhancing mass on CT in the superficial and deep lobes of the left parotid gland, but it has poorly defined uh, margination. And this was concerned for malignancy and was biopsy, but the biopsy came back as fluid granulomatous necrotizing inflammation, no tumor. 
Or look at this case where the T1 post contrast uh, fat saturated image demonstrates diffuse enhancement that's poorly defined in the right parotid gland. And, and this was a parotitis. Another uh, possible pitfall is that uh, benign tumors can be associated with the salatinitis and may not have sharp margins. Extraglandular extension of tumor is a useful sign for malignancy. Both of these cases here, uh, where you have masses extending from the parotid to the skin, um, are clearly malignant, um, but the imaging appearance is not specific for, for a particular pathology. Low T2, low T2 signal can also be useful uh, to indicate malignancy. It's been linked to highly cellular tumors. So here we have low T2 signal, uh, which is reflective of a sublingual clear cell carcinoma. And in the right parotid gland here, we have low T2 signal of a salivary ductal carcinoma. A potential pitfall is that chronic inflammatory disease can have low T2 signal and may have poorly defined margins, which can overlap with the malignant appearance. Now take a look at these three images in a patient presented to the ER with uh, right facial swelling. We have um, poorly defined en enhancement in T2 signal in the anterior aspect of the parotid gland with associated similar signal uh, changes in the uh, master muscle and overlying edema. The interpreting radiologist saw the irregular margins and enhancement and felt this was an aggressive parotid malignancy invading the master, so much so that ENT biopsied the mass uh, while the patient was in the hospital, and the lesion was a hematoma with associated edema. Two important clues to look at are that that this might not be a malignancy is that on the T1 weight image, we still see a preserved fat plane between the parotid and the master, and also the degree of hyperintense T2 signal. Malignancies tend to have a lower uh, mean ADC value than benign tumors. Look at, for example, at this right parotid mass, which has an intermediate T2 signal, which could be seen with a benign or malignant lesion. But the uh, ADC value is very low, and this was um, a mucoepiderma carcinoma. Um, in this example, we have a heterogeneous enhancing right parotid mass. And on the T2 weighted image, we have low central T2 signal, which is concerning for malignancy. And on the ADC map, we also have low signal in those regions of low T2 signal. So this was a carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma. The same principle applies no matter where the neoplasma arises, such as in this case, an adenoid cystic carcinoma arising from minor salivary glands of the palate, which has corresponding uh, low ADC signal. Some benign tumors and non-neoplastic lesions in the head and neck uh, can have reduced diffusivity. In the parotid gland, this is known to occur with a Warthin tumor, as seen here, and its low ADC value can uh, overlap with ranges given for malignant lesions. On the other side of the spectrum, pleomorphic adenoma characteristically has bright T2 signal and high um, ADC values that can be statistically um, separated from Warthin tumor and uh, a malignant disease. Some malignancies like adenoid cystic carcinoma are slow growing. However, the presence of rapid growth in salivary mass should raise concern for high grade malignancy or metastasis. In this case uh, of a patient with uh, uh, metastatic inf infiltrating ductal carcinoma of the breast, uh, a, a CT and neck performed in December showed a normal appearing right parotid gland. A follow-up in February showed enlargement and uh, patchy enhancement of the right parotid gland, as well as a few indeterminate lymph nodes. Another follow-up in, in, in May showed further mass-like enlargement of the right parotid gland, as well as some pathologic submandibular and level two lymph nodes, uh, which I haven't shown, which was biopsied and, and came back to be metastatic breast cancer. Keep in mind though that not all rapid growth is, is, is neoplastic. Infectious and inflammatory disease can also show rapid progression. The presence of perineural tumor spread is a fairly reliable indicator of, of malignant disease. Certain malignancies, such as adenoid cystic carcinoma, have a higher predilection for perineural tumor spread. We will need to inspect all the branches of the trigeminal and facial nerve, as well as the auriculotemporal nerve, um, which is what we're looking at here, with um, in thick and enhancement posterior to the right mandibular ramus. Um, and then in this case, we have an adenoid cystic carcinoma arising from minor salivary glands in the maxillary sinus with perineural tumor spread along the pterygopalatine fossa and into frame rotundum. Here's a case of a patient stats with left parotidectomy for adenocarcinoma. And in the initial scan, the enhancement and enlargement of the left facial nerve was not recognized. However, a six month follow up, you can see more enhancement uh, of the progressive recurrence at the stylomastoid foramen. 
Lymphadenopathy is a useful predictor of malignancy. First order drainage the parotid glands to level 2A lymph nodes and periparotid nodes. As in this case, um, where we see metastatic um, pathologic appearing level 2A lymph nodes in this patient with carcinoma exopleomorphic adenoma. In this case, a patient presented with the left neck mass, which was biopsied and came back as metastatic adenoid cystic carcinoma from a previously undetected minor salivary primary in the palate. A potential pitfall with nodal diseases that work in tumor, a benign neoplasm, can arise in cervical lymph nodes in a minority of cases. Also, consider that infectious or inflammatory diseases can simulate metastatic lymphadenopathy. So let's move on and look at, at, at some examples of some salivary gland tumors with characteristic imaging features. So pleomorphic adenoma, also known as benign mixed tumor, is the most common parotid tumor and most arise in the superficial lobe of the parotid gland. T2 signal higher than CSF is specific for pleomorphic adenoma and a high ADC value is characteristic. And large asymptomatic tumors arising from the deep lobe of the parotid gland, as we can see here, are likely to be pleomorphic adenomas. Smaller pleomorphic adenomas are typically uniform T2 hyperintense and enhancing with well-defined and bosselated margins. Larger lesions may have more heterogeneous T2 signal enhancement and dystrophic calcifications may be present. Multifocality is rare except in post-treatment cases due to incomplete resection or spillage of cells at surgery. And although benign, treatment is surgical resection due to the long-term risk of malignant transformation. And as with other tumor subtypes, pleomorphic adenomas occurring in other salivary glands besides the parotid tend to have a similar imaging, imaging appearance, such as in this case of a pleomorphic adenoma of the submandibular gland. Let's take a look at this companion case. Here, here's a 62-year-old male who presented to Ian Cleese Clinic with a new uh, right neck mass, which was palpated and felt to be lymphadenopathy. So here's his new um, neck MRI. He had had a prior uh, cervical spine MRI uh, approximately nine years earlier, which at that same level showed no lymphadenopathy, just for comparison. Um, the axial and, and sagittal images from the, from the current exam show a, a right peripharyngeal space mass with predominantly low T2 signal. And, uh, and, it was by, and it was removed, and this was a carcinoma X pleomorphic adenoma. It's interesting to go back and compare to the sagittal images that we have from that uh, MRI cervical spine nine years earlier, and you can see that there's a lot more high T2 signal earlier and, and, and low T2 signal now with the malignant transformation. So malignant trans... Um, Malignant transformation can occur in up to 15% of, of pleomorphic adenomas if left untreated. Findings of decreased T2 signal or ADC, rapid growth, facial nerve palsy, infiltrative margins, and lymphadenopathy suggest malignant transformation. Worth and tumor is the second most common benign parotid tumor, most commonly arising in the parotid tail, but up to 10% may arise extra parotid, such as in the upper cervical lymph nodes. Worth and tumors can have a variety of appearances, as I've shown here. They can be solid. They can be mixed cystic and solid, and up to 20% are multifocal, either unilateral or bilateral. They're smoking-induced tumors, uh, but the previously reported strong male predominance has been disputed in more recent reports. Worthen tumors have characteristic low ADC value, and they have high FDG avidity. The risk of malignant transformation is reported at less than 1%. Something I, I discovered recently was that Worthen tumor can decrease in size without treatment, either following a biopsy or, or after inflammation. Mucal epidermal carcinoma is the most common parotid malignancy and has a wide range of appearances, as I've shown here. It can be well-defined and, and, and solid or, or cystic. Um, it can have uh, poorly defined hazy, hazy margins. It can, be, it can have extra glandular spread. Um, and it can be invasive of adjacent tissues, as shown here in the palate or, or here involving the palate and maxilla, where there's also bone destruction. You know, a characteristic, uh, but, but not necessarily pathognomonic appearance of, of low-grade mucal epidermal carcinoma is shown here. Um, we have well-defined mass with heterogeneous T2 signal. We have bright T2 cystic areas and some areas of low T2 signal. Nodal mets are common in mucal epidermoids, and the margins of these tumors can help to predict the tumor grade. Adenoid cystic carcinoma is the second most common primary parotid malignancy and the most common malignancy in the other major salivary glands. And along with mucoepidermoid, are the most common malignancies of the minor salivary glands. Adenoid cystic um, is typically a slow-growing tumor and of the primary salivary malignancies, it has the highest propensity for perineural spread, as seen here involving the auricular temporal nerve and extending to foramen ovale. 
extending along the B3 segment and the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. The imaging appearance is nonspecific, with higher-grade lesions tend to have infiltrative margins and lower T2 signal, as we see with other malignancies. There's a tendency for late recurrence. Metastases most commonly occur to the lung and bone, as we can see with the calvarial metastasis shown here. Metastases to the are most commonly squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma from the skin of the face, scalp, and external ear, as the parotid space nodes are the first order drain site for these regions. Imaging is nonspecific, but parotid masses uh, in, a, in a patient with known head and neck cutaneous malignancy, particularly when you have multiple, is suggestive. When solitary, METs can look just like any other parotid mass, and prognosis is influenced by extra capsular spread. Now let's take a, a quick look at a few salivary masses that have distinctive appearances. Oncocytomas are uncommon benign tumors, and they're, so, they're called the so-called banishing parotid tumor because they become, tend to become iso-intense to the parotid when you do T2 uh, fat-saturated image, as seen here, or T1 um, post-contrast imaging with fat saturation. Salivary gland lipomas appear as lipomas elsewhere and are characterized by their fat density. Any nodular mass-like soft tissue component must be followed to ensure it's not a liposarcoma. Now, different from adults, in children in the first decade of life, mesenchymal tumors and vascular lesions are more common than epithelial tumors, with hemangiomas being most common. Their hemangiomas are, are characteristically T2 hyperintense, avidly enhancing masses uh, with, with internal flow voids, typically in children in the first year of life. Now, let's take a, a look at a few additional imaging pitfalls. The degree of apparent enhancement may vary with the uh, technical parameters employed, such as the timing of imaging after contrast administration. Here's a case of a pleomorphic adenoma with characteristic bright T2 signal, but on the post-contrast imaging, there's only minimal patchy enhancement. It'd be hard, uh, to, based on this image, to be confident that the lesion of pleomorphic adenoma. However, subsequent post-contrast imaging, post imaging obtained 10 minutes later shows more diffuse solid enhancement than we expect with pleomorphic adenomas. Also, remember that not all cystic lesions are neoplastic. We can have sialoceles, lymphoepithelial cysts, lymphatic morphemations, um, as seen here, as well as first branchial cleft cyst. And to complicate matters, there's an overlap in the imaging appearance of neoplastic and non-neoplastic cystic lesions, such as the sialoceles seen here and the mucoepidermoid carcinoma shown here. Post-op changes can mimic residual recurrent tumor. In this case of a patient who stats post resection of parotid ascending cell carcinoma, this nodular T2 hyperintensity um, and enhancement um, at the margin of the surgical bed was called residual tumor. This level of mild hyperintense T2 signal can be seen in ascending cell carcinomas, and follow-up imaging showed resolution of these findings compatible with post-operative changes. T1 and T2 hyperintense, uh, T1 and T2 hyper, T1 and T2 weighted lesion, so a T2 hyperintense lesion in the left parotid gland, uh, left parotid space, uh, following uh, parotidectomy. And this could easily be a, a recurrent pleomorphic adenoma in this post-op patient. But post-contrast imaging uh, showed that there was no central enhancement, so this was a post-operative sialocele. I want to mention some concepts that should be explicitly described in the radiology report. We want to use imaging characteristics such as margins to group the tumor as benign or low-grade malignant versus a high-grade malignancy. If we have multiple parotid lesions, we can think of METS, Wharton tumor, lymphoma, and oncocytoma. And you know, if there's been prior surgery, you, can, you could consider recurrent pleomorphic adenoma. Now, I've listed specific areas of invasion to specifically evaluate per salivary subsite that affects staging and prognosis in cases of extra glandular extension. Now, if you're ordering physicians not ENT, and maybe they're not as familiar with the intricacies of salivary gland neoplasia, it might be helpful to throw in the line at the end of, of your report, reinforcing that further imaging is unlikely to provide any more specificity to the diagnosis, and the patient needs to be, be referred to ENT for, uh, for possible biopsy. Now, I wanted to include a short staging cheat sheet. What things uh, can we look for on imaging that, and specifically mention our report because they affect staging? So, any extra parenchymal extension automatically upstages to a T3. For T4A, moderately advanced disease, we're looking for invasion of the skin, facial nerve, ear canal, or mandible. And for T4B, severely advanced disease, we're looking for invasion of the skull base, telgroid plates, or encasement of the internal carotid artery. In conclusion, I want to emphasize these key points. Imaging is usually not reliable for providing a histopathologic diagnosis of solid gland masses. And ultimately, tissue is needed for definitive diagnosis. 
we can use certain imaging features, for example, margins, to suggest that a mass is either benign or low-grade malignant versus a high-grade malignancy. But keep in mind that th these features are not infallible. An infectious or inflammatory process, for example, can appear aggressive and mimic a malignancy. In adults, the smaller the gland size, the more likely a mass is malignant, to the point that when you're evaluating a um, sublingual or minor salivary mass, no matter what you think it is, the odds are that the mass is malignant. I'd like to thank the following people um, for contributing images and concepts for my talk. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out to me by email or Twitter. Thanks again. Our next speaker is Dr. Yoshimi Anzai, professor in the Department of Radiology and Associate Chief Medical Quality Officer at the University of Utah. Dr. Anzai has served as president of the American Society of Head and Neck Radiology, and today she will be speaking to us on ACR Tyrad's potential pitfalls. Hello, my name is Yoshimi Anzai from University of Utah. Um, I want to congratulate Dr. Ilona Schumalfas to do this very first virtual ASHNA meeting. So excited to be part of you. Thank you so much for the invitation. So I have nothing to disclose related to this presentation. So I want to talk about why TIRAD? What is a TIRAD? How to use it? What are the benefits and pitfalls for TIRAD? And I want to thank Dr. Ann Kennedy, the director of ultrasound at the University of Utah for her system to uh, collect the cases. So incidence of thyroid cancer increased rapidly due to excessive diagnostic workup and also over detection of a thyroid cancer. Some autopsy studies shows that almost 50% of population have a thyroid nodule with a benign or malignant. Subclinical thyroid cancer has a very little, if any, impact on mortality. Uh, so the active treatment or detection of small thyroid cancer is not justified for morbidity and also cost. Adverse effect of uh, thyro thyroidectomy included vocal cord paralysis, hypoparathyroidism, which is much worse than hypothyroidism. And also some people worry about scarring the neck and also they'd have to take a thyroid hormone every day. And thyroid cancer is one of those cancers that led to bankruptcy and overall depression and anxiety. So the instance of uh, thyroid, increased incidence of thyroid cancer slowed down from 7% a year to 1.5% a year because we've been talking about this overdiagnosis of thyroid cancer in the last six, seven years. That's a good thing. So we still have to be actively participating, adapting conservative criteria for recommending ultrasound and also doing fine needle aspiration. So to me, the thyroid cancer for women is almost like a prostate for the man. It's kind of many people have it without knowing it and maybe not affecting your life. Autopsy studies show that 30% of a patient may have occult thyroid cancer without knowing it. And some studies show that ultrasound, um, the um, America, the 38 million people may live with a thyroid cancer without knowing it. And thyroid and prostate has an excellent survival. You can see this American Cancer Association data saying the five-year survival is over 99% of cancer with local and regional disease spread. Of course, so once you have a distant metastasis, the survival, survival goes down, both thyroid and prostate. The problem is that there are some bad apples. They're really aggressive, distant metastasis or bone lesion or lung lesion. So our job is to find those bad players. So why we have to follow ACR guidelines for thyroids? Uh, because there's so much variability on ultrasound recommendations, some people recommend all of it, some people recommend none of them. There's some subjectivity for ultrasound thyroid interpretation. And what does that mean? The lobulated contour with punctated density. And we want to put that interpretation into some category of uh, risk stratification of so this ACR thyroid make you all the subjective interpretation into specific category. The higher the score, the higher the probability of a cancer. So it's a wonderful way to show the risk stratification. And it's actually easy to follow 
and also litigation avoidance because you're following some societal guideline and also better patient care, to be honest. So there's a journey of instant thyroid nodule from discovery to surgery, and I want to kind of go step by step in every way. The first portion that we, diagnostic radiology, could contribute is discovery to recommend ultrasound. We look for size, lymph nodes, extrathyroid extension, location, and it check the patient's age, gender, risk factor, family history, medical comorbidity, and then measure the size, and then check the age, and then see if that patient's nodule meet the criteria for recommending ultrasound. So that portion, let me go back. Um, so this is a white paper by Jenny Wong in 2015. Um, and people remember age cut off for 35 and then size cut off for one and 1.5 centimeter. But really the important part of this diagram is really the suspicious CTMR findings. So if you have those findings, regardless of thyroid nodule size and morphology, we still have to recommend ultrasound. Point number two, limited life expectancy and comorbidity, meaning if the thyroid nodules are seen in a very advanced stage breast cancer or the cardiac failure or stroke patient, perhaps the thyroid nodule does not need to be evaluated. So that two piece is a very critical point of this paper. So this is what I do when I find a thyroid nodule. I just wanted to take a deep breath. You know, just meditate yourself a few minutes, I don't know, a few seconds. Um, and I look for three things, extrathyroid extension, lymph node metastasis, and also if you have an MRI, such as cervical spine MRI for DGEN, you look for a T2 signal. And I look for some old exam to see I can say that it's stable. And if you're not an old exam, then I look for medical records, history, any serious medical comorbidity that probably thyroid nodule need, does not need to be worked up. And then we measure lymph, uh, thyroid nodules and check the age and then decide whether I should recommend ultrasound or not based on ACL white paper. So two different patients sent a thyroid nodule. This is 2.5 centimeter, 45 years old woman, otherwise healthy. Now it looks kind of bright on T2, so likely benign, but this meet the criteria for ultrasound. So I do recommend ultrasound for this. This guy, on the other hand, is a little smaller, two centimeter nodule, but there is extra thyroid extension in the area of some T2 darkness, some evil gray. So this one is definitely thyroid cancer until proven otherwise and i do definitely recommend ultrasound and then make a phone call or talk to someone about doing an ultrasound for this case so what do you do for instant thyroid nodule on a ct scan well the ct is a little simple because you don't have a t2 signal in this case is there are the two nodules some hypodense uh, thyroid nodules one on the right one is on the left it's no extra thyroid extension, but when I check the history, patient has a history of ovarian cancer. So in this case, I will bury it in the main body of report and not to recommend ultrasound. This guy came in is a trauma. So there's a root out dissection, stat, CTA, head and neck, you know, that's the kind of thing from ED. And you can actually see the multiple cystic lymph nodes in addition to thyroid nodule. And nodule looks kind of little ill-defined, a punctated density, it doesn't look like a benign. When you go farther down, you can see the actual the inferior ischemic portion goes outside of thyroid and invading to strap muscle. So extrathyroidal extension plus cystic nodal disease. This is papillary thyroid cancer. And this is a 23 year old pregnant woman with neck mass. And you can see the multiple cystic nodule with a little nodule enhancing foci. Very, very suspicious for papillary thyroid cancer metastasis. Now, the thyroid didn't look that awfully impressive, but doesn't matter. The young woman came in with looks like papillary thyroid cancer. Recommend ultrasound. This patient had a papillary thyroid cancer. Now, moving on to when you recommend ultrasound. Now, here's the ultrasound of thyroid. What do we do with thyroid uh, ultrasound findings? This is where the thyroid classification comes in. And I highly recommend 
ACF Tyrant over ATA guideline because the threshold to recommend FNA is higher. ATA seems to be doing FNA for many small nodules. I will show you that in a minute. So here is the ACI tyrus. And then some people may say, wow, that's too complicated to remember. And it does look that way, but actually it's not too bad. So let me show you the second. So at ultrasound findings of a thyroid nodule are divided into five categories. It could be composition, echogenicity of the entire nodule versus shape and margin and echogenic foci. And each finding has a point system. You add it all together and a total point determine what type of category is. And type one, which is zero point, is benign. Type two is not suspicious. Type three is a three point, and that would be mildly suspicious. And type four or six point would be type four, and that would be moderately suspicious nodule. And a seven or above, it would be highly suspicious nodule. So total score determine the suspicious degree of suspicious for cancer. And that makes so much easier to get, oh, this is type four nodule or type five, three centimeter nodule and so forth. And each point has a definable recommendation. For example, type one and two, no FNA. It, we don't recommend FNA regardless of size. Tyra 3 and 4 and uh, 5, that depending on the size of the nodule that we recommend alters uh, FNA. For example, Tyra 3, which is mildly suspicious nodule, we use higher threshold, so 2.5 centimeter or above, we'll get FNA. 4, Tyra 4, meaning moderately suspicious nodule, the threshold is 1.5 centimeter or over, we do FNA. And type 5 is a 7 point or higher, highly suspicious nodule. We do the FNA over one centimeter. Keep in mind, only top four thyroid nodules are selected. So if you have a 10 nodules in thyroid, you can only do top four thyroid nodules. And you can ignore the thyroid nodule less than five millimeter. That's a good thing, right? Now, when you compare ATA versus ACI Tyrat study, um, highly suspicious or moderately suspicious nodules, we use a different threshold. ATA uses one centimeter cutoff for the highly and moderately suspicious nodules. Low suspicious nodules, ACR guidelines said 2.5 centimeter, but ACA used 1.5 centimeter. And a very low suspicious uh, nodules. We do not recommend FNA on the ACR, but ATA recommend even low, very low suspicious nodule recommending FNA over two centimeter nodule. So notice the difference in ATA to ACR. They do recommend FNA for many smaller nodules than ACR does. And this is just a normal thyroid gland of uh, on the ultrasound. We do transverse, or you can call axial <laughs> images, but longitudinal images such as um, these images. And then this is the top and then down. Notice the thyroid gland is a homogeneous kind of intermediate echogenicity and then hyper echoic than the strap muscle right there. So it's a good internal control to compare echogenicity with thyroid knot, thyroid pine come out, and also strap muscle. I'll show you in a minute. The crowded and jugular vein is more posterior and lateral to the thyroid gland. You can see this normal tracheal ring as well. Now, so this is your thyroid. There's those five components I talk about. One is a composition. So cystic, or almost completely cystic, has a zero point. Spongiform, uh, the findings nodule, which is more than 50% of parenchyma that's cystic, those get zero point. You have a mixed and cystic and solid nodule, you get a one point. Solid or almost completely solid get a two point. In terms of echogenicity, unechoic nodule got zero point, most likely cyst hyper or isoechoic compared uh, to uh, adjacent thyroid parenchyma would be a one point. Hypoechoic got a two point and a very hypoechoic compared to strap muscle. Notice the strap muscle. 
to be three points. So you can think of ecogenesis of thyroid nodules like a ADC, the darker, the worse. You know, the black one is a bad guy. Um, the next one is a shape. This is interesting. Taller than wide versus wider than tall. So the wider than tall, these are uh, assessed on the transverse or axial images. So wider one, the chubby guy, is actually the really good one. So they got zero point. Taller than wide, it's a skinny tall guy, nodules, I usually that one. And they recommend using AP versus uh, right and left um, dimension ratio over 1.2 to be taller than wide. That got three point. In terms of, mar in terms of margin, the smooth nodule got a zero point. And an ill-defined nodule, some shadows, or echogenicity got zero point. But irregular or lobulated border have a two point. And obviously, extra thyroidal extension got extra three point, uh, meaning three point for this extra thyroidal nodule extension, such as in this case, in struck muscle. Now, echogenicity, these are all... Uh, um, Back to this, all this margin and then uh, size is going to be just a choosing one point. However, the echogenic fossa, it choose all that apply, meaning any one of those, it can be added to that point. For example, no echogenic fossa be zero point and a comet tail artifact, uh, in said some mucus plaque things, it's going to be zero point, but macro calcification have a one point. And peripheral rim of calcification got a two point. Punctated nodular uh, micro calcification got a three point. But if you have a micro calcification with a macro calcification, you got one plus three. So you got four point for this echogenic foci. So let me just uh, try to use that atira. Uh, so this for here is a very uh, solid nodule and then two point, very hypoechoic, got a three point compared to strep muscle, wider than tall, so it's got zero point. But extra thyroid extension got a three point. There's no echogenic foci, so that got zero point, but total eight, which means over six and uh, eight. So that means tyra five. And this required recommending FNA, and this turned out to be papillary thyroid or calcinoma. Here's another one that example of a solid nodule got a two point, hypoechoic got a two point, taller than wide got a three point, lobulated contour, so got a two point, and no echogenic force has got zero point. At least this is nine point, which is definitely tyrat five. And this is the papillary thyroid or calcinoma. The not having an extension, thyroid, extra thyroid extension, but pushing the margin of the thyroid, not, uh, thyroid gland. Here's another case of a psoric nodule. It's got a two point. Hypoechoic got a two point. Taller than wide, got a three point. Irregular border is going to have a two point. Point, and an echogenicity is three point, so total 12 point, and this is a papillary thyroid or calcinoma, um, 22 years old with the thyroid nodules. This is a solid nodule for two point, very hypoechoic for three point, lobulated contour got a two point, wider than tall got a zero point, but punctate echogenicity got a three point. And this was a major thyroid or cancer, so it does apply for other papillary follicular and the major thyroid cancer, regardless of histology. This got pinpoint, and this was a major thyroid carcinoma. So, what are the benefits of thyroid? It's a standardized complex various ultrasound imaging findings into five categories. And each category has its own risk of cancer, malignancy. It allows extensive data collection because every institution, every thyroid nodule can be collected and it perhaps useful building a big database, data mining. Uh, and that's a really great way to uh, understand. And it used a thyroid score for shared decision making with patients. So when you're talking to patient, endocrinologist or surgeon talking to patient, you have a nodule, a thyroid four, this is the risk of malignancy and talk about some workup or surgery or active surveillance. 
the potential I consider to be maybe quality metrics because this is a highly complex thing. So although nowadays we have um, the power scribe but a click, click, click and checklist. So you can actually click the findings to get a total score comes up. So a little bit makes it easy for us to adopt the Tyra system. And it's been shown that adopting a Tyra reduced the unnecessary thyroid biopsy by 25%. That is huge. And this is, again, high value care because you're eliminating unnecessary uh, biopsy that not benefiting patients. So the potential pitfall for Asia Tyra, it, you know, there's some cancer that looks like cancer, but it's small. And what do we do that you don't meet the criteria, but it's suspicious for cancer? Multiple high-risk thyroid nodules, there's, there are multiple nodules in every place. So you can only do biopsy. So which one to recommend? And that is also challenging. But most difficult one is a follicular neoplasm. Follicular neoplasm is very challenging for all imaging modality as well as cytologist. It looks like a kind of benign, and it's the benign malignant one looks kind of benign. The benign one looks kind of not really clearly benign. So it was very difficult to make a determination. And a comet tail artifact, sometimes this is insufficient colloid material, but sometimes people call it mistakenly as an echogenic foci and upgrading a higher score. So this is a, here's an example, 52 year old woman with a back pain, with a thyroid, I mean, the, the metastasis to the spine, and you can see this enhancing lesion involving a thoracic spine with epidural extension, paraspinal softish mass, compressing a spinal cord, and CT abdomen pelvis is negative. And we look at this thyroid, and it didn't really look like anything there on the CT scan, even though it's not a high-resolution CT scan, but we recommend ultrasound. Uh, and then notice there's a, some nodule that are eight millimeter in size. And then the, when you look apply Tyrat, it's a solid, hypoechoic, but pretty, that's pretty well defined and wider than tall, no echogenic full size. So it's only Tyrat 4. So we do recommend the Tyrat 4 nodule over 1.5 centimeter for FNA. But in this case, because of the thoracic spine findings, we did a FNA and this turned out to be papillary thyroid carcinoma. So I think you have to put it into the clinical context of when to recommend ultrasound. I think a radiologist had the discretion to recommend a further workup, regardless of thyroid recommendation. Here's another case of a 23 year old woman with a left thyroid nodules. Now, the ultrasound study shows a solid um, isoechoic lesion and a smooth border, wider than tall, no echogenicity, so it's Tyra 3. But then she underwent, um, uh, she had FNA, she underwent FNA and it showed follicular neoplasm. But the follicular neoplasm is kind of like a wishy washy one that can't tell benign versus malignant. So she underwent hemithyroidectomy for diagnostic purposes. And a final pathology came up as a papillary thyroid cancer with follicular variant. So this is a challenge. So moving on to talk about some of this cytology of a thyroid nodule. This is a Bethesda classification from one to six. So Bethesda classification is a Bethesda system for reporting thyroid cytology. And there's a one would be non-diagnostic, two benign, Three is AUS, FLSUS, which is a tipia undetermined significance or follicular lesion undetermined significance. So basically, we don't know. I don't know. And this is the one that most likely recommended FNA. This is the four is also follicular neoplasm or suspecting follicular neoplasm, but doesn't really say follicular neoplasm or benign or malignant. This has a 15 to 30% chance of malignancy, and those patients end up is having a lobectomy for diagnostic purposes. And five and a six are suspicious for malignancy or no malignancy. And again, cytology also follows this basis the classification for thyroid nodule. So basis the three and four has been diagnostic challenges for all the thyroid care team. Now, papillary thyroid cancer 
For cytologists, it's a piece of cake. No one make mistake. It's easy to call PTC. But follicular neoplasm is sort of like a scratching head. It's very difficult to call benign versus malignant. So there are a lot of follicular neoplasm of indeterminate significance. So those AUS, FLUS, follicular neoplasm, when you're looking at all of the basis, the three and four, um, it could be follicular thyroid adenoma that are benign or follicular variant of a papillary thyroid cancer or follicular thyroid cancer or cell carcinoma. But 80% of them are benign on the surgical pathology, so it's only 20% of those become cancer. So what do we do in this kind of situation? And I hope I can recommend imaging, but right now, there are a lot of work are going on in a molecular diagnosis. If you have those AUS, FLUS, FNA patient, and when you find that only RAS mutation positive and no BRAF or LAT, MEK, or any other molecular uh, feature are positive, those only RAS mutation positive cases are benign biological behavior, the very high negative predictor value, and also excellent prognosis. So if you only RAS mutation positive, those cases can be followed clinically without going through lobectomy or another FNA. So in summary, a conscious effort has been done to reduce the overdiagnosis of indolent thyroid cancer, and we've been making a differences, but we need to do more. Tyra standardized ultrasound interpretation and management recommendation. It's great to have a risk certification and a predictive model so that we can actually talk to patients that chances of malignancy is 80% versus 20%. So what we have to do as a radiologist are follow the rule, just to follow the rule. It's not so hard. It's a white paper guideline for recommending ultrasound and it critically check the medical history and the comorbidity. Um, use of AC tyrod uh, for recommending FNA based on the uh, ultrasound feature and a tyrod category and point system. And then when you have an FNA showing basis the three and four, a molecular diagnosis to identify biologically indolent linger, uh, the thyroid nodules that can be followed clinically so that we can avoid unnecessary lobectomy or surgery. So with that, um, I want to end my talk by several beautiful arts uh, showing a lot of thyroid disease. So the thyroid disease has been there for a very, very long time. Uh, and you can see this beautiful art that uh, uh, we are all here together. And perhaps the thyroid disease is something we live with, not to die from. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much.